nets of the world. And let me see. Are we live? Yep, I'm hearing stuff. Awesome. Hey, everybody, we got a nice lively chat going on already. That's cool. Mm -hmm. We're here with Joel Schaefer talking and going deep into shamanism today. I'm going to go ahead and hit record, guys. Thanks for being with us today, Joel. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Look forward to talking with you. How do I sound, guys? Do I sound okay? Sound great. Here we go. Hey, beautiful folks out there in chat land. We love you. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions, throw them in all caps. It's easier for us to see them. And boom, here we go. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with my good buddy, Dr. Bear Paul Lando, coming to you live and direct from the great state of Jefferson, where freedom reigns supreme here in the Gorgeous azure waters of the Smith River flowing beautifully with all the rain we've gotten. Uh, we have a sun today. <laughs> it's a rare occasion. I was out basking in the sun right before the show bear, trying to get some sun on my skin before I head down to Mexico. I'm so pale right now. Uh <laughs> I know. I'm so stoked to see the sun. And uh, we've got a big uh, truck delivery tomorrow of stuff to get off spring planting uh here on the farm so we're uh we're officially in it we're working nice. oh that's so great uh you know folks might catch a little uh sound uh, of congestion in my voice it's funny bear i want to just add this real quick as a tangent coming off our series we've been doing on ending the medical mythology series which is wonderful and we're tapping into the cause of illness the cause of symptomology and of course in my own egoic mind i stated that i haven't had symptoms this year uh and i'm conquering that and what do you know it this weekend i uh this last weekend i started to get some fluid in my respiratory tract and feeling a little feverish and i was like no 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 okay Go back into what I've been learning from the great Dr. Bear Lando. Uh, it says all good. There's a reason why this is happening. Obviously, I didn't catch anything. Uh, so on Monday, when I got back home from, I did go snowboarding. I didn't let stop me from doing that. Um, but I was feeling pretty under the weather on Wednesday, on Sunday. So on Monday, I did some deep reflection and I realized what was the stimulant, the stimulation behind this bear. I was having some hanging fears. Uh, for my upcoming trip to Mexico uh, with uh, fears around missing my connection, stresses around what's going to happen in the airport there. I haven't traveled in, in internationally in a long time. And it was really deep down inside aggravating me. And as soon as I came to that realization that I had that hanging thought form, I, see, I balanced it with the thought that I'm good. All is meant to happen. Um, there's no fear here. Um, I did some dowsing. <laughs> I, I watched a Raymond Grace video and did some dowsing on it and boom. Is that a 45 bullet though? <laughs> no, dude, I, I wish I need to get one. I, I have bullets, yeah, but I don't too. have them so I can put the chain <laughs> on it. But uh, yeah. anyways, I, um, I was, when I went through this process, dude, I was just telling Alex Zek this a couple of days ago, literally within a half an hour, my lungs started clearing up. I started feeling better. Now I'm just kind of going through the final drainage process that the, the biology had kicked in, but it was pretty badass, dude. It was really cool to see my physiology react once I went through that emotional clearing, if you will. So I just wanted to bring up my own experience to the channel here and what we, what we cover and how this stuff's legit and real. And when you bring the practical knowledge to your life, uh, man, it can make life a lot easier because I feel like I, I healed a lot more rapidly than I would have in the past going through all the victim yeah. and everything, you know. And healing is awareness. That's all it is. I don't care if you're healing from some composting symptoms that we commonly call the flu or anything else. It's awareness. Awareness is the, the cure. And people often ask me, what's the best thing to do at the uh, exact onset of symptoms. And I always say, bless them. 
because if you have symptoms, it means your body is not only talking to you, but it's also doing something about something that needs to be done. And if we understand uh, biotrain concepts, then we work with it. And it starts with your thoughts that go into appreciation for this marvelous vehicle that we have uh, uh, largely created through our own experience. And, and when we don't have a reaction uh, that we call symptoms, then uh, it's the beginning of the journey through the six stages of disease, which Michael and I talked about a couple podcasts ago in which case uh, things progress into deeper and deeper issues. So if you're having a reaction like runny nose or upchucking or going out the back end, that's a good thing because your body is able to muster up what it's designed to do to purge the bioterrain, bring it back to its pristine uh, state, and uh, we're off and running. And then, of course, if you do a little homework uh, before, during, and after, and you know what's going on, and you don't have to live with unpleasant symptoms either, like you discovered, Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much, Bear, for all the knowledge you brought to us and the community and myself over the years. And I, yeah, I was hitting the cell salts. I hit the isopathic too. Uh, and all of that sto stuff, of course, uh, was very powerful. And I still am. I'm taking, I always take the cell salts, but I've doubled up and was taking other ones specifically for this. So, and yeah. And and final comment, uh, if you indulge me a second, all that I know at this point in my life is a product of my experience, but I opened myself to certain experiences a long time ago because some very special people took me under their wing for whatever reason and opened my eyes to certain things. And Three of those folks I would loosely call shamans of different types from different indigenous cultures, which uh, hopefully opens us up for today's discussion. Mm -hmm. You beat me to it. I was going to do the transition and you, you already took care of it. So let's hop into it. And yeah, I can't wait to see all you guys down in Mexico, whoever's going. It's going to be a blast. And of course, you can watch it virtually. Go to alphavedic.com forward slash anarchapoco. You can sign up for the virtual uh experience and you can catch bear's talk will be presented twice uh and bear has a phenomenal virtual presentation and then i'll be presenting thursday morning on um sovereignty and the elements and how we can master uh it's important to uh, understand the elementals for our own sovereignty and just tying in with nature all the stuff i talk about grounding structuring water the ether uh tapping into the sun all that good stuff so uh, okay, guys, uh, today we're really stoked to finally talk about shamanism and um, a great tradition that has influenced Bear and I immensely, and we've talked about this. It almost comes up on every show, so it's great that we can dive deep into this today with our guest, um, Joel Schaefer. Prior to the publishing of the teachings of Don Juan, uh, is it a Yaqui? How do you pronounce that? Is it Yaqui? Yaqui. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a yaki and I just knowledge. always said yaki, which I know is wrong, but <laughs> that's just my my pronunciation. Uh, it's like uh, we live here in Gasky, not Gasque. <laughs> uh, yak, uh, I'll say it, yaki way of knowledge in 1968. The role of the traditional tribal shaman was little understood beyond the realm of anthropological research and schools of mysticism. The present integration of shamanistic concepts within the lexicon of personal growth and alternative healing modalities would most likely not have reached its present momentum in the absence of these iconic teachings of Juan Matas to Carlos Castaneda, his often clueless protege. Quote, we either make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. So much wisdom comes out of this. Um, although the authenticity of Castaneda's 12 book series has at times suffered academic scrutiny, the wisdom and applicable practices shared through this seminal work has left an undeniable and lasting impact on the mindscape of Western culture. Today's episode follows the shamanic footsteps of Juan Mantis with special guest Joel Schaefer, a lifelong student of medicine men and women, healers, seers, and practitioners of the shamanic dreaming arts. Joel was trained in many aspects of intent over the course of his apprenticeships 
which he now shares as a perceptual guide for individuals seeking greater clarity, the strengthening of will, and reclaiming personal sovereignty. Quote, all paths are the same, leading nowhere. Therefore, pick a path with heart. This powerfully liberating process assists in the rediscovery of our innate intuitive nature, making it possible for untapped resources within our being to be accessed and utilized. The gratitude that comes from this type of discovery process has the power to transform our entire perspective and strengthen our relationship to source so that we can be personally guided directly deeper into our abstract purpose. Uh, Bear Lando, take it away, my friend. So, Joel, thanks for being with us, buddy. Uh, this is going to be a fun discussion. I'm looking forward to it. I get to uh, relive my 60s, uh, not my, uh, the 60s, I should say, a little bit. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, last down in Sausalito in Northern California in my favorite bookstore and uh, went to the metaphysical section. Even though I was in normie world and preparing for a football career, uh, you know, I was kind of dabbling in those things already. So I went over and there was a new release. It was uh, the teachings of Don Juan. And boy, I never looked back. <laughs> they were a great influence in my life. And, uh, you know, interestingly, um, when I got into more of my professional life, I actually met some real life characters, which is a whole different story. But, you know, paralleled some of those experiences there. Uh, but yeah, the sixties was a great time because uh, all of a sudden we're, uh, not just indulging in fantastical ideas, but getting exposure into new concepts and new realities. And, uh, all these years later, some of those things that did seem a little bit mystical back then, uh, you know, we can really explain now from a number of disciplines and cultures and actually put them to practical use. So that's what I hope to bring to our audience is, um, you know, we like to get out there and, and uh, get in the weeds over certain things. You know, it's a great fun discussion. But what I really want to do uh, myself is to bridge that gap between the conventional world, for lack of a better term, to the world of shamanism. And I believe that some of those things that I witnessed on early on in my own experience that I had no logical reference for, um, but it did shift my gaze a little bit or a lot, we'll say. Um, it set me off on a path to wanting to understand why there might be some truth that I was intuiting in these teachings and also, uh, you know, how things work. And I think that anything that we delegate to mystical you know, or metaphysical is simply science not yet discovered. So, uh, you know, I'd like to take uh, through this uh, at least one of the woos out of woo woo and bring it into the realm of practical knowledge and uh, hopefully use our discussion. Now, what it would be great is, you know, you've had your own experiences. And of course, we like to get everybody's perspective uh, because every experience is valid and it kind of adds into the collective for our understanding. So if we could start off a bit, uh, perhaps with you relating how you got all uh, into all this in the first place, uh, what was the original impetus, uh, what your life experience leading up to this uh, has been, and and why you think it's of value today. Now, that's about 90 questions in one. Sorry about that. So maybe just start with your own experience. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thanks yeah, for being with us again, by the way. We were, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, I, yeah, I was fortunate to run into some very powerful people at a very young age. And it was very, I was very attuned and uh, conscious of the difference of these people. And and so, you know, I, I was attracted to people who had perceptual expansion right away. And um, I got into some challenging situations with people that were borderline schizophrenic, but were also very gifted and capable uh, in many ways, very fluid in their perception. And I had a lot of adventuring. I used a lot of psychedelics from from 13 to 16. And I kind of veered away from my my peers and started hanging out with much older people. Um, 
And I used it in a really beautiful way. I was snowboarding. I was doing incredible things and having really amazing adventures. And um, but I, I because of that, I ran into a shaman when I was 16 years old. And uh, his apprentice was a uh, is now my wife. Uh, she handed me the first Carlos Castaneda book when I was 16 years old. And um, we both basically started studying Castaneda intensely in the and we were going to the wilderness and kind of were checking out from society pretty intensely. So we were practicing what shamans call gazing in the wilderness, where you learn to get really silent and you allow your eyes to start to cross and the world starts to move and you're able to sort of see a totally different landscape than the one that most people are witnessing. And the more you spend time in that, you sort of develop this muscle, this ability to stay in that attention and things start to get interesting. You start to hear sounds. You start to notice there's more to this world than what people say. And there are, I've validated that there are what we call inorganic beings that live in the wilderness, uh, entities of the night that you can, can encounter if you can stay silent long periods of time. And that was kind of frightening and intense. Uh, my teacher was really gifted and fearless. And so the way he helped us to develop uh, ourselves was to put ourselves in situations where we would face physical fears. So we would walk out on fallen trees that had crossed over valleys, like way up in the air. We were just walking on kind of like tightrope stuff. And you, you discover resources that you just wouldn't have if you weren't kind of putting yourself in situations like that. We would, we would free climb and boulder things that were really dangerous, but we felt stronger and stronger as we went along. Um, this teacher ended up getting pretty spun out on himself and thinking he was pretty incredible. So we had to get away from him, me and my future wife. And we want to find a, a, a shaman in New Mexico to try to recover from some sort of the, the kind of the cult we had got ourselves into. So we found ourselves in another cult, um, learning from a very old Indian man who was raised from birth. Uh, and taught he was taken away from his mother at birth and raised by his grandfather, which is traditional for uh, people who are chosen for particular paths within that 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 lineage. So uh, he was in his late sixties when we met him. Very very powerful dreamer. Um, he had he had apprentices from all over the world living with him in in New Mexico. Uh, his grandmothers would talk to him. His dead grandmothers would tell him in his dream time about people in other parts of the world that, uh, and he would, they would describe, you know, this woman's going to be at a concert in London and she has a tattoo on her arm that says this. And if you go there, she, you know, she will become an apprentice. So he would send one of his apprentices to that concert. They would see the girl, they would tell her. And pretty soon she's in New Mexico so this guy had a lot of reach in that respect. He was considered a prophet. He was actually very close with Credo Mutua, who David Icke refers to a lot. And so he was flying to, to Africa quite a bit to do really difficult exorcisms because he was really gifted at that. Um, so I ended up, you know, in a pretty in-depth apprenticeship living in-house with this man. And he wanted me to be his protege because I was quite... Uh, I'd already had a lot of experience and I was really familiar with the Castaneda material because I was reading it like a manual, which uh, I believe it is, you know, Castaneda dreamt this material into being. It's not just random experiences. He laid it out in a way that it can be utilized to really develop your dreaming attention and to reclaim your power, especially the recapitulation. Um, so eventually ended up it, you know, meeting a medicine woman who came into this group who was separate and she started to help a lot of us get out of that group as well because it was, there was imbalances. Um, so I, I ended, ended up apprenticing a, a very powerful medicine woman and living with her in El Paso, Texas. And by then I had married my wife and we had a child and we were all living with this woman in El Paso. And she was doing the most incredible healing work. She was helping people uh, recover, like, find alternative ways to deal with cancer. She was helping finding missing children, helping the police, um, really advanced in, in her capacity for lucid, lucid dreaming. Um, 
And so she was a major turning point for us. We, we got a lot of healing from being with her. And, um, you know, then for years, I just integrated everything that happened. And I ended up being a student of the Castaneda apprentices, which is cleargreen.com. They, uh, when Carlos, before Carlos died, he started a group called Clear Green. And uh, they teach Tensegrity, which is the magical passes, uh, the movements that that Carlos decided were necessary to unveil to the world, which were once kept secret. Um, and so I spent 10 years training with them, traveling all over the world, going to their workshops. And I was fortunate to spend time with Carol Tiggs, who is in the Castaneda books. Uh, she's one of the most advanced dreamers and is still alive today. Um, so that's kind of the background of how I got into this and I, uh, did a real deep dive and I'm, I'm now sort of at a time where I'm starting to share and offer my, myself as a teacher and a guide, um, after having gone through all of that. Uh, yeah, fantastic background. And, uh, for anybody who's read the books and knows some of the characters that were, in the entourages, we'll say, of the different medicine people that are in the book. Uh, it's it's fantastic that you've actually got to meet some of them. And some of the Tensegrity, uh, is, I think that's what it was called. Yes, um, um, Some of the movements are suspiciously resembling uh, movements that, uh, you know, are brought forth by other cultures like the Sufis and whatnot, right? Yeah, I mean, I think when you're in a state of heightened awareness and silence, uh, it makes sense that people would be guided to similar movements that they would be discovered naturally. Um, and then there was martial artists that came into the Toltec lineage that it took the magical passes and brought more martial form to them. Um, so yeah, the whole point of the movements is to get out of your mind and into your body. And so some of the forms are really complex, because if you were to try to use your mind to remember them, you wouldn't be able to. It's like you have to really allow that bodily memory to kick in. Um, but they're different than Qigong or Tai Chi or other things because they're designed to influence lucid dreaming. And they're, they're, they're energetically focus is to basically access resources um, or break up energetic crust that surrounds our toroidal field. And if people don't really know about that and they start going and exploring that, it's not something you can just learn overnight. But once you start to understand the, the intent behind the movements, massive shifts of perception start to occur. And when you're doing these movements with hundreds and even thousands of people in sync, there's these waves of energy that goes across the group and all this silence becomes accessible. It's like tangible and you can feel the the focus in the room. Um, and so much can be done with that. And I think that's why these teachings are so important to our future, is that when we realize that if we can all, rather than get all of ourselves on the same track mentally, if we can get ourselves all on the same energetic frequency, uh, we can do what the Mayans did, which is to travel in and out of this world and go and spend time in other layers of the onion, so to speak, um, and even eventually, if we needed to, we could relocate humanity to other places that are habitable. Uh, one thing I like about traditional, we'll just call shamanic training, is uh, they really believed in grounding and also being in your physical body. I had a, an old school... Um, mentor in the martial arts early on and we went through really rigorous training of mind and body but one of the yeah. things we did that was not just for conditioning but also to build that just that trust in your spidey senses we'll say um we're in hawaii you know living at, at that time with this gentleman and we went up to the Iao Valley, if you know Maui at all. And there's a river that runs down the canyon. And the uh, river, like most rivers, you know, has rocks uh, going up, not just on the shores, but also all the way up through because it's a shallow kind of creek-like river. So we would uh, run up there full speed, like a full two miles. And you never know where your feet are going to land. You're only as good as landing on the next rock sticking up out of the water and, 
And uh, it, it was amazing conditioning, but also just for developing that trust that somebody somewhere is guiding you. And I, I believe in the Don Juan books, you can refresh my memory because it's been a long time since I've read them. Uh, they also did a lot of uh, exercises at night and having to uh, develop the ability to um, hike and, and not run into trees and rocks and things when it's pitch black outside. Yeah, they call it the gate of power and um, mm -hmm. experience. Oh yeah, that's right, the gate of power. I've experienced this myself and it's really what changed everything for me. Uh, I was alone mm -hmm. in the mountains here in, or in Seattle area, Tiger Mountain and uh, treacherous terrain, very, very dark, no moonlight. I was on mushrooms and I just got <laughs> the incredible feeling of trust that overcame me and I felt the darkness holding me. Like literally, I was just, I, 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 I don't know what happened and it's never happened to this degree again. But uh, I completely surrendered and I, I literally was, my body was, I couldn't feel my feet touching the ground, but I could see like barely that, that it was, and I was moving it. I was, it's such a steep uh, trail that I was running that I had no, I couldn't even slow down if I wanted to. I was full, it was a full send, full commitment. And I was just held the whole way down and I discovered a resource within my being that completely activated my dreaming consciousness and made me uh, feel a, a type of trust that I don't think most people know about. And it's a type of trust that will change your life completely and allow you to, you know, make decisions from a place that's much more energetic rather than mental. Um, so it's just an incredible thing for people to experience. You don't have to do it extreme like I did. You could go out in a much like in a desert where there's less challenges and just play around with running at, at high speeds in the dark. Um, you probably fall a few times unless you take mushrooms and it'll probably work right away. But um, it's all about just yeah, playing around with silence until you feel it's about having a relationship with the mother and feeling that support and that, that, that you're being held. And that's, when you know, you can start to, to surrender more and more. The other thing I like to do is running on the beach. Even during the day, I'll run with my eyes closed. Yes. I, and and then I try to do a practice where I see through my eyelids and I start to see the beach again as mm. I'm like projecting my consciousness now. And yeah, I get some weird looks sometimes. <laughs> I open my eyes and I'm about to, people are looking at me weird. I'm way off course. <laughs> like way. Um, and with the rocky beaches here up in, you know, Southern Oregon and stuff, it's even more challenging because you're trying not to step on sharp rocks and uh, shells and barnacles and all sorts of obstacles. So it's a similar kind of concept. I'm just bringing up that you can even do if you're um, you don't want to go out in the middle of the night and do that. Um, but that is, I, I did want to circle back real quick on the energetic crust <laughs> of cleansing. Cause that is so phenomenal. And it kind of taps back into the symptomology I'm going through through right now and i'm just thinking of like uh was it krillian photography i mean there's the russian uh mm -hmm. science where you they've been able to photograph the energy the biofield the bioenergy and for those scientific more western-minded folks out there they're like what is what is he talking about how how is dancing and doing moving and stuff like that affect their energetic biofield could we tap into a little go a little deeper into that and sort of the multi-level reality and and practice there because i think that is really deep and profound stuff yeah um you know don juan would take carlos out into the world and show him different examples of people as a as a to help him understand like okay you know some people have a lot of energy and some people don't and some people are really under hypnosis and others are quite liberated and and he would teach him to see energy they say that we have this toroidal field that surrounds our physical body and that most people on average there they have the, there's a film of energy that can go up and around the entire feet the entire toroidal field or what they call a luminous cocoon um and most people's energy goes up about to their heels and just stays put because there's a, uh, a an energetic predatorial force that feeds off of humanity and it's it's they say they say we're not the top of the food chain and that we're being, you know, we're being harvested, essentially. 
And that's our major predicament is that if we could learn how to keep our energy instead of handing it over to these forces, we wouldn't be as easy to control. So shamans do the magical passes as a means to build that energetic film all the way up around and peek it out at the crown. And eventually this, these, what they call the flyers won't, the, the, the taste becomes um, unpalatable to them because of the discipline. And so shamans are left alone to build their energy where most of humanity serves as a buffer and is being, you know, basically harvested. And it's a really disturbing thing to witness for Toltecs is to see this, this act of, uh, of energetic consumption occurring. So the reason we do the movements and the reason that we stay in silence as much as possible is because this predator has lent us its mind. So we have a natural mind and then we have a generic programmed hypnotic mind. And uh, in order to free for shamans, this is why silence is so critical, um, is that you are able to energetically transfer your attention to a more natural place, which will allow you to return to those that pure affection that you felt from like zero to four years old before the predator got a hold. And so shamans make the pilgrimage to get their youthful energy back. And they do so through a very advanced type of breath work called the recapitulation. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, our organs, uh, everything is connected to the, how much energy we have. And so shamans say that, um, you're, e you're either losing or gaining energy in every moment. And we want to basically take care of our sexual energy and our essence in a very unique way as a means to make sure that our chi is really strong. Uh, that'll allow us to have the most incredible insights in dream time. Um, and yeah, so it just leads to this energetic development that leads to a very healthy life. Um, so I think it's just a, a matter of you know, getting to know that there's a secondary function to every organ and starting to utilize those aspects of our being. Um, and this breaks the energetic crust. So the sh shamans are actually do movements that look like very martial and they're breaking that crust and spreading that, that energy is usable. So it, just because it got crusted doesn't mean you want to get rid of it. You want to break it up and spread it across your entire luminous cocoon. So a lot of the movements look very strange, but that's basically what you're doing. You're, you're um, redistributing very vital energy to different parts of your system so that it can be used for an abstract purpose rather than sort of the, 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 the typical standard way of interacting in this world. But the abstract starts becoming more tangible than what we used to think of as tangible. Uh, you know, in the old jargon, what you're describing, I believe they called retrieval of spirit. So yeah. all the leaks that you have, uh, you know, we have to plug those leaks. You know, I actually have a, a way of medically evaluating people where I can quantify whether their electrical system is in a state of net energy gain or net energy loss. And in yeah. the martial arts world, we were taught how to cultivate and gather energy in all the ways that you're talking about, maybe in, you know, slightly different ways with our animal forms and, you know, uh, different drills and things. But basically, uh, when you gathered energy, not only were you more proficient in the work, but also um, you were able to meter out your energy very consciously. So if you were in combat, for example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you only let out enough energy to get the job done. Exactly. And you're always in this conservation of energy, not out of a concept of lack, but just for the sake of, you know, mastery is about using just enough and not too much. Don Juan used to talk about how, especially people that have had children, are prone to having a hole in their luminous cocoon, which is, uh, you know, the biggest leak of all. And he described how that needs to be healed. And it makes perfect sense because as a parent myself, a uh, grandparent as well, you know, you have these uh, strong and uh, attachments to certain people out of, you know, pure love and desire to support them. But at the same time, you know, I think most of us uh, mistakenly start giving our energy away. So that's another leak. 
And just to ground this in with one more comment, if anybody doubts whether there's a predator situation mm -hmm. within our realm, whatever you think it is, then just look at all the ways that they are farming our energy by keeping us in a perpetual fear state with every institution without exception. So if we're, you know, worried about who's going to get elected next or if the sky's going to fall in or you're watching porn online or whatever, you're constantly in that agitated state, which is what they feed off of. Now, of course, they've got cutouts and proxies that are, doing the wet work in the appearance world, but um, would you like to talk about uh, maybe who these, uh, who I always call the boys from downstairs, who they are, the guys behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's the big breakthrough is realizing that, you know, as others have said, that this is, this our, our situation isn't, we're, there's no need to be at odds with the people who are the puppets. It's getting to know what's really going on, where, where, where the puppet master how it operates. And it's kind of like if you were being attacked by a, a, a jaguar in the jungle, you wouldn't be offended at the jaguar. It's jaguar being a jaguar. And so there's no reason to be offended by this non-human force that is seeking our light. It can't help it. It's, we're very attractive, beautiful creatures. And these, these beings, uh, they dull their light out for long periods of time because they're more like immortal. They live these really long lifespans and we live really short lifespans in comparison. So we've got all this bright, beautiful energy that we're just playing with all the time. And these forces, uh, I don't even look at it as a negative. It's just a challenger in place to help us cultivate and develop our power. And eventually we don't have to be less than on the food chain. We can evolve. We can learn to take care of our energy so completely that this parasitic force has to find somewhere else to go, right? But that's not likely to be the case. Most, most, more than likely, that some of us will learn to take care of ourselves, and the majority will not. It's just the nature of the system we're in. And so, um, coming to terms with that and realizing that, you know, we we're not here to save the world. We're here to save ourselves. And the more people that learn how to do that the hundredth monkey thing will kick in and it, that courage will start to spread and people will start to take care of themselves in, in the ways shamans have learned to take care of themselves. And it's not discipline as much as impeccability. There's a difference. Discipline. I know a lot of disciplined people and it doesn't lead them to freedom necessarily, but when you become fluid and you're, you're following your heart rather than your mind then you start to energetically take care of yourself in a very specific way that is more liberated and less controlled than like a disciplined method. Um, and I'm not, I'm all for discipline. I just think that at one point it needs to tip over into uh, a much more a system of guidance so that, you know, cause see the, the way the these predator works is it keeps you as a victim and it can feed off of you there. But if you come out of victimhood, now it's going to try to make you think you're special it's going to try to turn you into a cult leader or try to get you to, uh, you know, identify with your specialness. And that's another way in which it uses you. So uh, finding that neutrality where you're not above or below anybody and you really honor and respect everybody as an energetic being, then you are, are less easy to control by this predatorial force. And you start to see through the facade and you start to realize that this is a dream and that we don't have to pay attention to the details so much. We can start to use what they call the dreaming gates to access other layers of the onion. And that's where the adventure starts to come in, where you can go to sleep at night and travel and see other worlds. And it's so beautiful and incredible to have access to what they call having your third eye open, you know, and be able to, to really, uh, have glimpses of these other incredible things that you couldn't even imagine. People are like, well, that's just your imagination. I'm like, no, your, your imagination is something very different than, than having actual glimpses of other worlds. It's, these are real places that shamans learn to validate by working in groups. And they actually travel in dreams uh, in, in large groups in order to validate energetic understandings. And, and that's what seers are, people that can see energy 
directly as it flows. And for those of us that have had experiences like that, once that's happened, you're no longer as distracted uh, by this world. You become fascinated with the possibilities of perception. But it does begin with the imagination being opened to other possibilities, which opens the doors to actually go to those places. So, and it's yeah. curious that in our present academic circles, we're taught that imagination is not real. Mm -hmm. And also discipline has been used against us too. Discipline is, is now more uh, synonymous with um, discipline relative to uh, more intellectual and mental plane studies at the expense of, you know, uh, cultivating the discipline of the heart and right. the real discipline, of course, to go to these places is disciplining, uh, disciplining our emotional or astral body so mm -hmm. that we can't just be yanked in every single direction because the emotions are what are the fuel to get us anywhere in the first place, you know, otherwise we're just a bunch of empty thought bubbles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which where the shadow work comes in is getting to know any area within your inner child that is unresolved and hasn't released any, you know, because uh, often at some point in our childhood, we were told to stop expressing ourselves um, on some level. And because we were so young, we didn't know how to deal with that. And so we, we built armor and that armor is keeping us, which are our shields that keep us from being able to have, you know, truly liberating experiences. And so often disease and uh, things that are manifesting, although disease is your body's way of attempting to repair itself, there's aspects of this that are emotional based. So we want to make sure that we get to our feelings and uh, the recapitulation is helpful in this, that you go back to your childhood and reclaim your imagination and your creativity. And, and sometimes it's challenging to do so, but uh, the more we can experience childlike feelings and tap into those memories. So I, I've been able to go back to when I was six months old and I remember the feeling of, 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 of my perception just moving all over the place. And because I regained that experience, it's completely uh, loosened my assemblage point. It's made it possible for me to have a, a much more flexible perception. And uh, the more I recapitulate, the more I'll be able to uh, return to those places of pure affection, which will uh, eventually, you know, really transform me uh, and, and anyone that seeks to do that kind of work. For our audience, can you elaborate a little bit on what the assemblage point means? Because um, that was uh, very, um, foundational, you know, in some of the work that I was involved with is actually being able to locate and move this assemblage point. So maybe if you could just explain what totally. that is to us. Yeah, it's a tricky thing to explain, but it's uh, we we uh, um, we have this luminous cocoon and and ultimately Toltecs say we are not physical creatures. We are energetic creatures. The physicality is an illusion and it's a convenience. It's a way of interacting with this realm and it's a beautiful thing. And we can turn that physicality into pure energy uh, eventually and to merge with eternity through, through, you know, very advanced types of alternative ways of dying. The assemblage point is what moves when you, your perception moves. And they say it's located um, on the kind of above your back left shoulder on the outside edge of the luminosity mm -hmm. of the cocoon. And that it it's uh, it's something that can move anywhere within the cocoon and even outside of the cocoon. And so shamans, they, they people don't believe this, but old school shamans used to be brujos. They could shape shift into werewolves or they had their power animals that they could, you know, utilize in dream time and out in the desert. You know, um, and so people have had some really incredible encounters with powerful shamans. And this isn't necessarily all, you know, love and light. Some of the shamans are very uh, into manipulating other people. And and so there's a there's some challenging elements to what goes on in different parts of the world as far as shamans go. But being able to move the assemblage point is critical to our survival as a species. Otherwise, we will perish. 
the assemblage point has been controlled by this predator and it's been um it's very difficult to move your assemblage point and liberate it because the predators cannot feed off of us if we free ourselves from the rigid relationship that we have with perception and if the assemblage point uh is something that is shamans are able to see and validate uh and they can tell with the slightest fluctuation or movement of the assemblage point that the person starts to perceive a different layer of the onion and so um we are dreamers we are meant to travel we are meant to go from this layer of the onion to many other layers and to have an intimate relationship with the earth mother and the earth matrix mm -hmm. and she will she will guide us in this process as we learn to communicate in those nonverbal ways and have uh, the, these types of feelings transmitted to us from the mother. So, yeah, it's, the assemblage point is a very mysterious affair. Uh, our perception is not, our consciousness is not stored in the brain. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's people make all these assumptions in the scientific community or at least try to, but I think it's critical for you know, Toltecs are referred to the scientists of energy and they're called the learned ones. And it's because they were given this, this knowledge of the assemblage point. And so healers can utilize the assemblage point as a means to help a person restore their equilibrium. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of fear that can come with moving the assemblage point because it feels like the carpet's being pulled out from under you. So a lot of people panic when, they are on psychedelics and the assemblage point starts to really move. But if you can surrender to it and, and find that trust uh, and have that sort of adventurous spirit, then you can allow that assemblage point will eventually take you out of the place of reason where humanity lives and returns you to the place of silent knowledge where you don't not need the internal dialogue in order to track. You can use a more advanced an old school energetic way of perceiving your situation. So the mind is not as needed as people think it is. It's a wonderful tool uh, and you can use it in very advanced ways, but it requires that we stay silent for long periods of time in order to access the movement of the assemblage point. So would you say that perhaps uh, this is hopefully segue us into another aspect of your work, which is dream work. Um, would you say that the dream work uh, would make one more amenable to uh, having a fluid assemblage point? Uh, you know, sure. I, uh, I'll, I'll share one, um, one anecdote here. I got heavily into dream work with one of my mentors a long time ago and uh, started actually incorporating it into medical work. And I had a, uh, my most memorable and first experience doing this and you know it's not something that you go to bed and you say this is going to happen but you cultivate as you're aware uh just the ability to be more versatile in your dreams we'll say but i had this one particular client who who came in and was very advanced you know not uh gonna live for very much longer we'll say and so in a dream um i was with her and the message, of course, it's all nonverbal. It's just understandings that you have um, was just to be there, hold a space until something happened, no matter how long it took. Wow. And in the dream, um, you know, it felt like it was days that I was there with her, not moving, not doing anything. Wow. It was probably a matter of moments, you know, in reality in the dream. So what happened is I started actually spinning above her head. My whole self was just spinning and then actually became a vortex. And now years later, when I got into the studies of waveform mechanics and toroidal uh, fields and compression radiation and all that, um, I realized that after a while of being in this vortex engulfing her, it was actually a radiation portion of mm. the cycle that was then undoing or unwinding we'll say a lot of the programmings that were keeping her in the belief system that she had this physical illness in the first place mm -hmm. so um i woke up and it was very dramatic you know i have a good memory 
of it to this day, even though it was like almost 40 years ago. Wow. And um, I had a scheduled appointment with her. She was staying on the property in our clinic. We had live-in units and uh, she was better within a day. Now, I take no um, credit for that. There was obviously other uh, larger forces at work. And I got to witness of the, the fact of going into this space with her and then unraveling things from the other side and then getting to uh, yep. experience in a, in a so-called waking moment that the disease was gone. So it, it's powerful things that we're talking about here, right? Yes, sir. Oh, powerful, brother. Thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. And yeah, the medicine woman I apprenticed in El Paso was very much involved with her, um, with her clients um, in this way. She would use dreaming to 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 connect with them, and um, yeah, Toltecs have discovered that there's something called dreaming gates, and that you can cross these dreaming gates um, through practice, and it re it does require consistency. But the assemblage point, every time we go to sleep, it moves. And the trick is to be able to follow it and not for like the, the forgetfulness of dreams is very common. But if you can, re shamans seek to be conscious 24 hours a day. And so you can learn to, uh, to be very alert, even when you're in deep places and to re to, to, to have access to those memories. Um, but there's, yeah, so the, the reason we do the movements and the recapitulation is ultimately to be able to move the assemblage point in a way that would allow us to cross these dreaming gates. So the, the first gate of dreaming is just being able to realize you're dreaming. And the fact, you know, so they say, look at your hands. As soon as you realize you're in a dream, look at your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll help you. And then, and then you'll, you know, the, the dream will start to move into the, um, to these areas where you want to sort of like figure out how to keep consciousness so that you don't go into the unconscious, but eventually you can go to sleep in your dream, uh, and wake up in another dream. And now you've crossed into the second gate of dreaming. And if you go to sleep in that dream, especially if you go to sleep in the same position, like on the right side or on your back, you enter into the third gate of dreaming. And now you're deep into these places that they say are more real than the dream you and I are in right now. And so whenever that happens to me, I, I literally shock runs through my whole body and I wake up in both. I come all the way out. I come through, I wake up in that dream and then I wake up back in this body. It's really hard to handle the intensity of having crossed over these thresholds. They say the fourth gate of dreaming is where you encounter your parallel being and you actually dream someone else's dream, but it's very much you just in a different uh, sort of lifetime. And so they don't believe in re reincarnation in the typical way. They believe that there's parallel lives and that they're all happening simultaneously and that we all mm -hmm. live in the eternal now. Um, so the benefit of dreaming gates and dreaming consciousness and learning to do these things is that we can um, re remember what we are. We've been convinced that we're just these like bipedal creatures that are limited. And in reality, we are time travelers. We are seers. We are perceivers of energy. And um, the dreaming gates are a means to sort of literally cross thresholds that would allow you to unlock resources that most people would never consider even being possible. And that's why Castaneda's work was deemed fiction is because it, it gets into areas that are so phantasmagorical that people can't conceive of it being possible. And therefore, you know, it's been sort of uh, put in a box that I think it needs to be released from. And then, of course, along the way, um, a lot of skeptics uh, will yeah. get involved and there's been challenges to the authenticity of Castaneda's work. And, uh, you know, I, I kept my ear to the ground hearing some of those folks out. But yeah. from my perspective, it really did not matter whether this was a literal translation of experience, uh, more of an allegory for a composite of experiences. Um, because the truths 
hold true across all cultural teachings mm -hmm. and they can be put to practical use and they work. Exactly. So of course the, the intelligentsia will try to get in and just create debate and lose the kernel of what we're, you know, all about in the first place. Yeah, man, it's it's sad that there's so many witch hunts when it comes to things like this, but it's it makes sense. Um, and, you know, if Castaneda made all that material up, then he's even more powerful than if he was an apprentice to Don Juan. Right. Like what <laughs> exactly like, that, that would just prove that he's even way more in tune. Um, but if, if all these people who question the validity, why aren't they coming and training with Carol Tiggs to find out if she's the real deal or not? They're not. They're just hiding in their basement, writing articles that are just complete. It's just the same thing as all the people that are defending germ theory. They're just all they're not willing to. They're not curious. They're not, you know, uh, open. They're closed. They're fixed. And they're literally defending their egos instead of being open to having really expansive conversations about what's possible. And so uh, I, I'm really glad that we're in a time where more and more people are kind of being exposed. Like, you know, it's, uh, I go on Twitter spaces a lot to see the people that are defending these deception models. They're very, they attack, they're very condescending people because they're defending, uh, not just this information, but it's they're defending their 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 past, their ego. Their they need to 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 know that they were not lied to. Otherwise, their ego would not be able to handle it. And so we're in really unique times. And I think the Castaneda material is very helpful in exposing those that are uh, willing to learn and and unlearn, and those that are going to continue to perpetuate this concept that things are pure that science has reached its pinnacle and everything nothing else is to be discovered and it's uh it's a sad state of affairs of what's going on in academia and uh yeah Castaneda is uh, was a magical being Carol Tiggs is a magical being they uh are travelers or were Carlos is no longer with us but yeah uh the people that practice this stuff discover that the recapitulation is so real and the dreaming gates are so real that it's actually quite threatening to your social power. You start to, you have to make a decision where you're going to stay in social power or actually move into actual power because you start losing interest in the things that most people are focused on and you become pretty abstract. You become a little bit weird and, and you go through a period of wanting to be alone because you just don't relate to other people's pursuits and your purpose gets really clear. So in, uh, I think the journey to Ixlon, which was my personal favorite. And I, and I, uh, before I forget, I'd like to ask you if you have a personal favorite out of all the books. Um, but in that book, which I just really related very deeply to, I believe Don Juan talks about the path of the warrior being a very lonely path. Mm. And uh, if you'd like to comment on that, I think you already just did. But, um, and then, uh, you know, follow up, uh, do you have a favorite book out of the series and maybe why? Yeah, you know, um, I've read the Castaneda books over and over and over and mm -hmm. over and over and over. And uh, because I really believe what Florinda Donner Grau, who was also an apprentice of Juan Matus said is that it's a manual. And it's meant to be read over and over. Um, and the path of the warrior is, you know, the way in which it's referred to. We call them warrior travelers. And you, you do become very called to your aloneness, which I refer to as all oneness. When, you, when you've reached a really unique state of aloneness, you no longer feel separate or isolated. You feel connected on such a beautiful level that you no longer need the validation of your fellow man. You've been in contact directly with source. You've been held, you've been seen, you've been validated and you become liberated, right? So a lot of people avoid their aloneness and it's unfortunate, but that's kind of the test of a warrior is can you be alone and can you keep your energy and not get distracted and not need to uh, sort of seek the comfort of of people. 
And once you've crossed that threshold where you're at peace with your alone self, uh, the door is open. You're now in a new territory and you can start to cultivate your awareness in ways that are truly magical. Now, the predator mind will try to tell you that it's dangerous. You're isolating yourself. You're going to die alone. You know, you're getting old. You need to be around people. And so there's these breakthroughs that happen where you you allow that voice to be heard, but you don't give it any power. And you it starts to, to, to let you go. It realizes it no longer has control over you. And that's a moment in a warrior's life where they will remember for the rest of their life when they've they freed themselves. And it's usually like in a vision quest or something where you've spent considerable time alone and you cross over past that fear. Um, so for me, the, the, the books uh, are all really equal in a lot of ways, but the most recent book is called The Active Side of Infinity. And he wrote that like in his last few months of his life. And it's really uh, very strangely powerful in that it, he, he finally came out of fear and he moved into acquiescence. And he, he just, he, he, he explains that process and he goes throughout his life. He goes back into his past and he finds people like ex-girlfriends and he goes to make amends. He goes to make sure that he has no debts to them, that he has energetically freed himself from any, um, so this is the advanced stages of the recapitulation where you actually go and make sure that you cleared your past and you've erased your personal history through this very specific way of doing things. Um, also, The Art of Dreaming is the second to last book, and it's what explains the gates of dreaming and how to utilize them. So it's filled with incredible tools. Um, so yeah, I just... I uh, also recommend for people listening, The Sorcerer's Crossing by Taisha Abelar. She was a student of Juan Matus. And then Being and Dreaming by Florinda Donner Grau. She was also a student of Juan Matus. And uh, these are very powerful books, especially for women, because uh, the female apprenticeships with these teachers were very different than the male apprenticeships um, and uh, highly recommended. Wonderful. I just got on the website myself here and uh, hadn't been to this. So uh, this would be fun looking this over. Well, cool. so um, go ahead, Michael, you were going to say something. I was now. just going to say thinking of this dreaming technology, which is really what it is. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a technology. Your volume's that... a little low there, Mike. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me now? I was just oh, going to say that this dreaming technology, which is really what it is, we're talking about a ancient technology, is going to be, um, I think, as the crisis moments become more and more apparent as we move towards this technological emergence, um, mm -hmm. we're going to, those in power that understand this power that um, do not want to go down that path of this sort of... Rudolf Steiner would call the aramonic sphere of technological materialism. Um, we'll need to, this is going to be sort of the technology that will counter that. Yes. I mean, we, we've been saying this at Alpha Vedic since the very beginning. This has been a theme we've, we've talked about uh, since our very first podcast, uh, transhumanism and natural law. Wow. And it makes me think of this MTV series from the 90s, Ion, Ion Flux. Eon Flux, which was this like really trippy animated series about this dystopian world in the future where it's just completely technocratic. It's all run by science and machines and, there's, and most humans are like robotic. But then there's this like class of anarchists that are fighting back. And how do they meet? How do they, where do they find their power? They take this, I think it's like a pill or something. It's been a long time since I've seen this and they meet in a dream world. Yep. And that's where they were able to have their secret meetings and plan and where they find their power. And it's literally this like mystical, magical side of human consciousness, just defeating the technological uh, robotic materialism. And I do believe we are going to see that emerge more and more in the coming years very rapidly. So as you're saying, you know, people aren't, people will start to out of necessity wake up to these powers. Yep. 
Exactly. It's it's what the Toltecs say, that there will come a time where humanity will need to understand what shamans have learned, otherwise they will perish. And uh, it's it's not about our physical death, it's about the death of spirit. And um, so as transhumanism rises, forces rise to meet each other, right? And that's what's so amazing about this dream, is that uh, out of necessity, like you said, and more and more people will become attracted or uh, find interest in these areas that once seemed mysterious or, or unaccessible and they'll start to take care of themselves in unique ways and we'll start to have the ability to uh, communicate through tele telepathy uh, direct knowing we'll be able to meet in dreams and have uh, conversations and eventually work together in groups in order to decide how you know, like shamans say that women used to, that, 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 that the secondary function of the womb is the dreaming box and that women used to determine our evolution. Um, but until we reclaim our dreaming attention, we won't be able to use these organs in these magical ways or use our bodies in the ways that would allow us to, to see and validate these things and, and move into the place of detachment that is required in order to truly travel and and uh and 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 to discover and learn more about this realm and that's where uh some of the things we're talking about really start to run parallel courses with other teachings for instance rudolf steiner you know, from an anthroposophical perspective, you look at the three divisions of the body, you look at the torso with all the vital organs, which is the yin, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the feminine principle, the metabolism, the thing that uh, cultivates life as uh, including the evolution of where life is, uh, you know, directed, uh, you know, whereas the extremities are going to be more, uh, you know, the mobilization of our will force and so forth. So, um, you know, we're and, and that's where we started off this discussion where I was saying perhaps uh, we need to get all of our vocabularies together, whether it's anthroposophical, shamanism, alchemy, uh, as above, so below. It's we're all really talking about similar things, aren't we? The Easter, yes. da, uh, the Eastern Dantian, two bear, you know, that's the yep. thing too. They and then the whole chakra system and all that. I mean, all the great. We talked about this yesterday, Joel and I have been on the interview, like all the great traditions all synchronistically work together because they're all coming from the same gnosis. They're all coming from the same truth. And that's just another great example or uh, proof that there is a field connecting us all. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's where this truth's coming from, whether there be a grand tradition where it all came from, you know, Atlantis or whatever. That doesn't even matter if we understand how the science works because we're all in the same soup together. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's so cool. It's this is this is the validation process is that people came to these conclusions through their own journeys and it all leads to this to very unique but uh similar conclusions. And uh like what uh Bear was saying about the energy that is given to our children. This is a real important thing to understand that concept like life begins at conception. You do have a, a, shamans have validated this and there is an, a, a chunk of luminosity that is lent to your child. And a lot of parents don't understand that. And they, they're actually jealous of their children. They're like, they feel drained and their child's running around with their energy and they end up having like a power struggle and then they discipline them and they're like, you know, in this unconscious wound of not knowing the exchange, there's like a, a subconscious confusion. So being aware of this and being willing and lovingly to, of course, you would give your luminosity to your child so that it can develop. There comes a point, though, when their child grows up and they can start take care of themselves, where that energy will return to you because they now have the ability to cultivate their own. And so there's a time and a place where we stop being a helicopter, I mean, we don't want to be helicopter parents at all, but we want to figure out how to give our trust, our children to, to go through their own rites of passage and to develop energetically uh, in their own way. And, but without these understandings, there's a lot of power dynamics that play out in sexual relationships or in parent child relationships that aren't 
very honest and get it just leads to some confusion so we want to understand how these energy exchanges work uh and 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 how important sexual energy is to take care of so that we're not you know operating from a place of confusion yeah that's that's a big one that we touch on periodically it's uh the, you know the culture we live in they have you coming and going they've got you know a lot of us grew up at a time with um you know just a lot of judgment and shame and 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 everything about uh you know our sexuality and then at the same time you walk in any store as an adolescent when i was growing up and there'd be racks of playboy and everything else and every advertisement you know so so you feel bad and guilty and then at the same time you know they're just always uh you know doing the carrot so um you know of course what they should have been teaching us is the fact that it's energy and we can with our intent uh direct that energy and use it for other things and uh of course the predator class would like to see nothing more than for us to dissipate it just doing stupid stuff yeah the, the toltecs say that the predator runs humanity through their genitals and it keeps people focused on you know these uh, this 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 aspect of our being without us developing it in a way that would be useful uh to our evolution and it just it just it's very obvious when you start realizing that that, that that's the case it, it's very much shown and represented so shamans learn to come out of you know you don't hand your power over to these things anymore but you also don't want to be in shame and guilt either right so it's it's finding that dance of getting to know where you're at and becoming sexually healthy but also there's a time and a place where you'll be called to celibacy as you advance on the path because you want to learn how to use that as a fuel as a means to travel in your dreams and the more you're able to get comfortable with having all that energy and not needing to release it uh you become quite fearless and you start to feel powerful and rightfully so and you can start to apply that to your martial arts to your to your profession uh to your relationship with your partner i mean it's incredible to be able to be in a celibate relationship and both parties be you know honoring that energy and there's all different kinds of things you can do with it you can reach these states of pure affection where you're just dripping with affection but it doesn't have to cross over into the physical or even if it does, it can become a much more magical type of physical, you know, where it's not focused on orgasm. Instead, it's focused on just the exploration of the tantric arts and the different ways in which we can get to know uh, what we're capable of, because that's dreaming, right? Like you can be in a, in a sexual encounter and all of a sudden both of you stop and just look around and there's like, you're just in that excitation. You can use it to start to go into these other layers of the onion um, like this fog will come into the bedroom or you'll start to see energy. And it's really magical when you're uh, with, when you can find a partner who can match your power and you're both <clears throat> have a lot of sexual energy, but that you're being very, you know, conscious and careful with it and using it for creativity. And I would argue that that's in fact, when true intimacy begins is uh, when you aren't just trying to relate uh, out of pure sexuality. And then of course, uh, big pharma has come to the rescue of men that have already dissipated their energy to the point where they can't get it up anymore. So you take a little blue pill and wring out the last few drops of life force you've got left. And uh, yeah, it's really sinister uh, when you think about it, but you know, it's, it's an experience for all of us. No. Yeah. I, 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 I call it very gangster of them. You know, these are, these are gangsters. <laughs> they, they're, they're very effective at uh, figuring out how to, how, how to control us on so many levels. So it's, it's amazing to observe, but rather than be at odds with what's going on in the world, I look at it as a necessary, uh, catalyst like it's showing me the unconsciousness shows me exactly what i need to see even especially if it's a family member or somebody close to me it's like i'm getting an upfront close view of what it would be like had i walked down a different path and it's quite disturbing but also liberating and it, it helps me understand and feel real gratitude for the difference 
but it's not that I'm putting myself above. I'm putting myself in their shoes as much as possible. And I'm suspending judgment and I'm really witnessing their, their trauma history and recognizing how they got to where they are and how lucky I am that I was able to heal my trauma to a degree. I still have a ton of stuff to work through. Um, but yeah, these, these relationships that we have that we think, Oh, this person, uh, they should be doing this or that. I, I don't look at it like that. I'm, I'm just thankful for everybody's reflection and everybody's a messenger and everybody has something to teach me, uh, especially people that live under bridges and, you know, some of the most incredible energies uh, experiences I have are from talking with people who would be considered schizophrenic. Um, they're they're They don't have the same filters as the rest of us or, and, and some of their insights or the way in which they interact with this realm is just fascinating. And often it shows the proof of the assemblage point because they'll go from raging anger to total and extreme laughter and back to anger and then back to laughter within half a second because their assemblage point's moving so fast. It's showing you what can happen uh, which is an incredible teaching for Toltecs is to have that understanding seen up close in front with somebody who would be considered deranged. And, and yes, they are, but the reality is they just didn't have the proper teacher or the appropriate opportunities to make use of their loose assemblage point. So is there a such thing as the collective assemblage point? Well, that's, yeah, it's like the, the flyers have figured out how to make sure most people's assemblage point stays exactly in the place of reason. And so we used to, the assemblage point used to live in the place of silent knowledge. And then a predator arrived and, uh, and it knew exactly what to do. And it, it moved the, the humanity's perception um, to this place of reason, which makes it Incredibly, the place of reason is not a place to avoid. It's a very effective thing. You can build skyscrapers from the place of reason. You can engineer the most incredible architecture from the place of reason. You can build worlds. That's what the Masons are. They're world builders. You know, it's there's there's knowledge in the place of reason that's necessary. The trick is, is that uh, if we're isolated just to the place of reason, then all the magic will dissipate. And so those of us who were born, so I had, I had friends who they were born with their assemblage point or they, they were raised in a way where their assemblage point didn't really stay in the place of reason. They're kind of uh, weird and, and odd because <laughs> of that. And But they, they uh, are really helpful people. They're the artists. They're the ones that are more kind of daydreamers. Right. And so it's harder for them to fit in. It's harder for them to, to to achieve the same tasks. But if we could really honor people who ha are different and find a place and a way to bring their creativity into the world uh, as a as a balancing force. But um, we we do have a predicament at our hands, and that is that we we are in a fixed perception, experiencing an illusion as if it's our only reality. And it is through the assemblage point and the movement of it that we can return to a place of silent knowledge in which we are so much more efficient and functional and magical, and we would live much longer lives. Um, and we wouldn't even have a normal type of dying. We would, um, we would be able to, rather than our memories flash before our eyes when we die and we lose that those awarenesses, that awareness, we would be able to keep our awareness and glide into eternity and to merge with the earth mother in one of her many layers of, of her being. And, uh, and that's what shamans seek to do. And maybe a, an additional element we haven't, we've kind of alluded to um, is that when we're doing our grounding practices and training, they were speaking on earlier uh, also being in nature and understanding that when you're like bounding from rock to rock, not knowing if you're going to have a place to land in the first place, there are other uh, elementals and intelligences working with you and you become very um, attuned to that, which also facilitates your own journey. 
And, uh, you know, what we're also talking about on this path is when you do your own um, exploration, we'll say, it automatically builds empathy because you have to go through every human condition and feel like, uh, feel what it feels like to detach from all mm -hmm. the things that you thought were important, all the things that you think you love, but were for different reasons uh, altogether in the first place. So it becomes increasingly difficult in the journey to start pointing your fingers at other people because you, you get it. You've been there. You've experienced that. And of course, empathy, I believe, is how uh, humanity will shift its collective assemblage point in the end, I think. Yeah, if, yeah. If so that's what the design is supposed to be in the first place. Yeah, I agree. It, it, you know, shamans really value sadness. They say sadness is the most prevalent force in the universe and that it, this incredible anguish comes to shamans. They they feel everything all at once. And it's and they they reach the point where they stop weeping and they just have this energetic shiver. The shiver moves through their entire body and it reveals great truths to them, uh, emotional truths almost like and and so we want to we want to take care of ourselves so that we can handle those jolts and to be shown those things on those really profound levels that move move us on every cell within every cell of our body and and on a cellular level that's what recapitulating is is you're you're purifying your cells and you're 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 freeing yourself from the heaviness of routine and you're releasing your story of who you were and erasing your personal history through the recapitulation, um, which is the most magical act of purification that exists. So we can do all these different things as doctors or healers or shamans to try to help people, but ultimately it's their own personal soul retrieval that will allow them to go back and deal with the undealt with so that they can really reclaim their power and, 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 and then you can completely change your life. You don't have to be going in the trajectory you're going. You can completely get clear on your purpose and it will reveal, you will be guided directly as to how to proceed. And then that allows you to come out of your mind and be in your feelings. Um, and, and that's where women have an advantage. But, you know, it's just a matter of really like where men have an advantage in the physical world, women have an advantage in the, in the energetic. And so we can really learn from having a powerful partner in our lives who helps us to learn about the difference between man and woman. And especially like Carol Tiggs, being a very powerful female dreaming Toltec teacher, her presence and consciousness is so significant. And just even the little bit of time I've spent with her has had a greater impact on me than people I've spent decades with. So time is, they say time is measured by intensity not not by the the tiktok it's has to do with you know how it and, and what you were talking about in dream time you can have a dream that's going on for days but it was only 30 seconds and that's the secret to the assemblage point you can move your assemblage point to places where time is under a different set of it's under a different construct entirely and that's where we're going to really kind of that's the advantage of being able to do dreaming is that you can uh, like for a shaman, they, they can have a day in their life. That's more intense than the, than an entire person's lifetime. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting time to be alive. And as I mentioned in the intro, I wrote for this episode, um, I believe those books, the teachings of Don Juan were very instrumental for this whole incoming age. Uh, I know my generation, uh, even though a lot of us all fell fast asleep again, uh, yeah. it, it still did have a lasting impact. And that's why I always enjoyed those books. You know, the one I mentioned that was my favorite, The Journey to Ixland, it was because, um, am I pronouncing that uh, yeah. properly? Correct. Um, when Don Juan was 
telling Carlos about the solitary nature of the warrior's journey, it had such a, as you know, you used the word profound, and it really was profound in it. To me, it struck a chord of deep, um, I'm looking for a right word, um, bittersweet. Yes. <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, it was saying goodbye to everything near and dear, but at the same time having an elation or mm -hmm. being free. Yes. And um, that's mm -hmm. what those books really brought me to, you know, help. Yeah, me too. Uh, bring me to that point of realization. Yeah, for sure, brother. It's a, uh, it is. It, this is a world of terror and beauty. And so, to become aware is terrifying, but the beauty balances it, and it's all very mm -hmm. bittersweet. Where spirit is receding, we are in it. With it, it, there is great sadness, and there's great purification in that sadness. And so being able to really have the courage to speak your heart, to really be in gratitude for the moments that are truly profound and to be willing to sit in that intensity, right? Because often we have a moment, it's so amazing, but then we're just like, our autopilot kicks in. We're just like back in the car, leaving the, the woods. And we, why did I leave? Like I could have just stayed all day in that feeling, <laughs> but this, this robot part of me just like automatically left. Right. So going back to what you're saying about being in nature, like the trees are conscious and they're communicative. I was, I was framing a house by myself on the roof in New Mexico quite early in my apprenticeship. And being alone is what made it possible. But all of a sudden I looked around and the trees were all observing me. You know, I was, I, I could feel their, 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 their observation and it just really hit me. And ever since then, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness and I allow my gazing and, and my relationship with these beings, these incredibly conscious creatures, I allow that to become, you know, to go to new and more profound levels. And you can start to feel the roots. You feel the tree with every fiber of your being. You know, a bird flies by and you feel the flight. You're, you're no longer just being the observer. Your perception starts to allow you to become one with, right? So gazing at the ocean, you become the ocean, right? It's we're not separate, but we perceive ourselves as such. And so when we stop allowing those limitations to rule us, we become interconnected with nature. And then it comes to the point where you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a skyscraper, you're still connected to the earth at all times. You feel her, you feel her consciousness, you see things for what they are. It's just a dream world we built and it's just as magical as anything. And so I can be in New York City walking in a crowd of people and it's just like, it's the most psychedelic thing and I might as well be in the forest. It's just magic because everybody in their unconsciousness and in all their hustle and bustle you can just stop and just see it like they show in the matrix you're just like can you just observe all this unconsciousness and it's a real boost because it's psychedelic it's like holy shit look at this this, this whole place this whole system and you can feel the mother beneath the street you can feel what that place looked like before they built all that stuff you can almost have like a soul memory of what uh, genetic memory becomes accessible. So our relationship to the mother is significant. And Toltecs say that they didn't want to die. Uh, and they, did, they weren't prepared for the ultimate crossing. So they became trees. They moved their assemblage point to the place that they became trees. So if you go to the redwoods, you'll find these groves of all these grandfathers and grandmothers that were once Toltec warriors that have chosen to live, to extend their life by becoming trees. And you can feel the difference and it's, it's truly profound. Like the so shamans, they call, they call it witnessing, but you want to, you want to release the burden of your story to somebody in your life. And if you don't have somebody, you can use a tree and you, you would offer tobacco to the tree and ask if it's okay. And you, you sit with that tree and you just share your story and all this emotion will start to come out of you and you'll feel the tree receiving your story. And it's such a beautiful thing to have happen that 
again, it leads you to this ability to be alone and not in need of other people to validate your, your life. And because you're not alone, you're never alone as long as the mother is, you know, holding you. And it's just a matter of being able to receive that love. And a lot of people can't receive a compliment, let alone see, receive love, right? So our, our armor is our shield and we want to de-armor and and so I'm so thankful to have a powerful partner who's helping me to de-armor, right? Because she sees my unconsciousness and is willing to to tell me, you know, hey, you're in your head, you're in your you're talking Toltec stuff instead of in your feelings. And so it's it's about finding people in our life that'll really support our path as well. Yeah, I, I love that. And I don't know if there's any correlation, but in the world of plant medicine, uh, in my experience, uh, preparations from trees were always the most powerful. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Plant medicine. And um, a lot of people are using plant medicine these days <clears throat> very aggressively. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it makes sense. But there's uh, a lot of people are avoiding the integration process and they just keep going to the medicines instead of. So that's why I like the Toltec system is they they discovered their knowledge through power plants, through very daring people. But they realized that it's unsustainable to rely on power plants. And so they came mm -hmm. up with the movements, the recapitulation and the dreaming gates as a means to take a much slower and much more realistic uh, as far as survival goes, a method and means to achieve these sa these same states that are available through power plants. And so I, I, I find it, we don't want to be scared of anything. And so if you feel scared of taking mushrooms or something, that might be an indication that it could be really liberating. But for people who have already had those experiences, it's really worth considering taking the slower, longer road to get to those same places, because then you'll have understood how you got there. And you will have integrated your the shadow work along the way in order to get there. Because when you recapitulate all the undealt with stuff from your past and all the programming that makes you go into autopilot, it starts to surface and you start to what they call stalk yourself. You get to know your habits right. and you get to know how to free yourself from the heaviness of those habits. So um, spontaneity or healthy routines that aren't heavy can really make a huge difference when you're ready to start to, to do that inner work. Yeah. And, uh, well, things that are psychoactive, of course, is a whole different classification. Um, and I don't believe in any shortcuts. In fact, sometimes the shortcuts, uh, lead you down longer, more circuitous pathways, um, oh. plant medicine, you know, of course, prepared in the old alchemical fashion, um, sure. where the practitioner makes uh, their own medicine and understands the creative forces at play uh, that created that botanical specimen in the first place, and then also becoming one with the process. Uh, you're already going through a healing process without even taking the medicine because you're working right. with the, the patterns and the intelligence. And it's really not something external that you're expecting to fix you. Beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. There's that's, that's really profound that you have experience in that area and, um, and that what you're doing and in, in helping people become aware of their ability to heal themselves and with your support, it's amazing work. And, yeah, the, the, this whole, the mother has so many different um, medicines that uh, that can be utilized as a means to, to really bring balance into our lives. And it's just a matter of listening for sure. So Michael, you've been uh, quiet over there. I know you're uh, taking care of our community. Any comments from yourself or the rest of the folks out there? Uh, just really enjoying this conversation between you two, as I knew I would. Um, and it's just been very rich and nourishing. Thank you, guys. Uh, the chat's going off. People are loving the the conversation, the back and forth. Um, there's just a lot of congruency in terms of people coming from all different traditions, once again, you know, uh, in different places in their lives and seeing all of this truth 
that's emanating mm -hmm. from what Joel's saying and what you're saying today, Bear. And um, I think people are really inspired to dive deeper into their dreams and mm -hmm. into um, activating that side. Um, Joel, would you, I know you have some workshops or that you're going to be offering. Uh, would you like to share with our community what you're currently up to on that side of things? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a an online course that is still available to enter. We've started, but you would get the first couple recordings as part of entering. But it's called Dreaming Our Purpose, and we're just we're we're doing these shamanic movements together, and we're talking about different principles from the Toltec system, from the Castaneda material, uh, such as conception, inception, fear, clarity, power, old age, and death. So shamans say that death is is the ultimate advisor, <clears throat> that we want to be conscious of our death and that it's a feminine force and it's sentient. They say that death is the player and life is the arena. And we want to bring the consciousness of our impermanence, uh, our mortality. Even though we discover our freedom in our immort immortal soul, we want to really embrace the mortality of, of this temporary uh, way of of interacting and so um really amazing people have joined this group and it's a really great uh we have a private group chat on telegram where we're all connecting and sharing our experiences and all of our dreams are being affected just by being in this group intent um we're covering some really uncharted territory energetically and in, in intellectually um but yeah, dreaming, you know, is something that you can play with without going to sleep. Right? There's something called dreaming awake. And so it's similar to like being on mushrooms, but you learn to induce that state in a sober way. Uh, and, and through silence, walking in the woods alone, learning to use gazing, uh, doing the movements. Um, and then what I practice at night is a dark room dreaming where you put a blindfold over your eyes because your eyes are open and then the room is pitch black. And so you're trying to eliminate as any light from being in there. And these, this purple patch or blue patch of energy will show up if you can stay silent and it'll start to shift uh, into. You, so gazing is like, you're not looking directly at the thing. You're sort of letting it be in the periphery and that allows you to make observation of it. If you go to turn toward it, it turns with you or or you'll lose sight of it. And it requires a very unique state of, of perception to be able to perceive these things. Um, so we're playing around with these things in the group. We're, 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 we're inspiring each other by each other's dreams. We're, uh, but it's a program that's designed to, or it's a, <laughs> I don't like to call things programs, but yeah, it's a system that's available to kind of, uh, help us unlearn some of the intellectual things and get more into the feelings. Um, yeah, and I'm some of the most unique dreamers that I've been working with as a mentor for the last couple of years are in this group. So there's a lot of benefit to to, to learning from them as well as they have ma major contributions. A lot of people have been studying this material for decades, like I have, and have found the, have found me through uh, my channel, which is Perceiver on YouTube. Um, so a lot of, a lot of people watch my videos as a means to sort of prepare for this course. And, and the course is just sort of the beginning of something I'll be doing for, for many years to come. And it's kind of good to get on in on it, on the, the initial stages, because there are magical aspects to blueprints. So we want to, we want to use blueprints, not just uh, or we don't want to get rid of blueprints necessarily. We want, we want to also learn how to use them. Uh, so people who are involved in this in the beginning will, will have input into how the future of it continues. And uh, yeah, so feel free to reach out to my email at four directions, 77 at gmail.com. If you're interested and we do a, a little 30 minute consult to make sure it's a good fit for you. And, uh, and yeah, it's a great time to be entering the course if you feel called. Yeah, I, I would argue that this work is more relevant than ever in the times we find ourselves in. So I'd encourage uh, 
anyone in our audience that uh, if this is speaking to you, uh, get a hold of Joel and uh, take advantage of this, this wisdom of the ages. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Joel, for making it available, available to us and, and really committing your life to this work. Uh, that in itself is the warrior's journey. Yeah, it's my path of heart for sure. And that's what they talk about in the books is <clears throat> finding a path of heart, you know, and and it's okay to admit that if we're not on a path of heart and to really reflect upon that and and get to know what it is that we truly desire to do with the rest of our time. Because often it, they, Toltecs say that it kind of hits people in, on their deathbed and they realize mm -hmm. that they spend a lot of their life doing something that was more, uh, you know, autopilot than natural and that they missed out and that there's this pain of anguish that hits them. And, and so we want to have those deathbed moments. Now we want to feel what it is that we're longing for and get really honest about that longing and then pursue that, even though it's uncomfortable and intense to get honest about these things, it's so worth doing because on the other side of it, there's incredible freedom of expression through your dancing, your dancing will change, your ability to celebrate life will get significant. You'll know where to go, when to go, and who to go with. And you start to become not only a traveler in dream realms, but a traveler of this earth. You start feeling called to go spend time in the mountains in a place you've never been, or you, as Jason Brashear says, break pattern, right? We want to, we want to get out of these uh, pre we're, we're very predictable creatures. If something was hunting us, it would know exactly what we were going to do just by watching us behave for a few days. And so we want to get creative in how we spend our time uh, so that we're, we're become less and less predictable. And as, as Don Juan said, you want to, you want to live as if there's a fog around you and nobody knows whether you're coming or going, including yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get out of the dungeon programming. <laughs> as Jason says, uh, yeah, that's so on point, dude. And I love the idea of the hero's journey, that concept, right? Which fits right mm -hmm. into this. And um, meeting those challenges face on, head on, because that's what ends up leading to the growth and why we're here, right? <laughs> it's the whole point. Totally. <laughs> Uh, this has been so cool, Joel. I hope you can, you know, we talked about it yesterday a bit, but I'm inviting you once again to come out to Music and Sky, uh, you know, maybe lead a workshop there and engage with everybody that is intentionally done in nature, that event. And it's also in a place where there's no cell service on purpose. Yeah. So it really is all about getting grounded into nature and mother nature and um, with each other in a way that's very intentional and also very tapped into these higher, the higher resonance around um, our true powers and, and coming out of heartfelt, you know, love and all that. Um, so once again, yeah, it'd be just great to have you there and meet you in person, man, hang out. Um, guaranteed you'll know some people there. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. So I'm so glad you guys have put this on and um, I've, I've been wanting to come and I, I'm really going to try to make that work. I'll talk to my wife uh, and, and I'll reach out and let you know ahead of time because I would love to lead a workshop and people would really benefit from how grounding the magical passes are, how anchored you get to the earth. You feel like a tree, you're rooted in a way that, you know, is really significant. And when you're really rooted energetically, you start to become conscious of these other aspects of your being. And, um, and then that opens the door to, to more exploration. So I appreciate the invite. Uh, I'll do, do my best to make it happen. I really enjoyed meeting you, uh, Bear, and really enjoyed our talk yesterday and today, Mike. So thanks for uh, bringing me on. It's an honor. Thank our you. Pleasure. And Joel's uh, YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com forward slash, oh, that would be at sunwolf1111. Uh, that is in the show notes below. Please go subscribe to his wonderful YouTube channel. As he just said, I was interviewed on there yesterday. And uh, we talked, Joel, about having the good old Bear Lando on your channel, interviewing him. I think uh, you uh -oh. guys can go deeper into some war stories there goes the neighborhood <laughs> as we we were talking about before we hit record or before we went went live you you guys have some similar stories on how you each 
made it to Montana, which maybe you could share on your on your channel. That was quite. Uh, I don't know awesome. if I should share that one in public, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll think about it. Yeah, uh, no, I'd love, I'd love to. I, I'll be reaching out there and hope to could get you on my channel as soon as possible. So look forward to that talk. Well, I would look forward to that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, brother. Well, thanks, guys. I hope you all enjoyed this wonderful talk. I'm looking forward to jumping through my dream gates tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to get into level three, maybe. We'll yeah. see. And uh, so much fun, man, playing with dreams and uh, and getting back tapped into that. And one thing I'll say about that, I've noticed when I really am focusing on expanding my lucid dreaming that uh, I start to have more psychic instances in this physical dream yep. where um, there's been occasions where I knew I had an illuminated uh, spark in my memory where I knew already what was going to happen that day or that night. And it fully unfolded that exact way. And there's it's it's kind of hard to explain how that realization comes to you, but it's like, you know it. And you're like, wow, that's, I just saw the future. Because <laughs> as you say, as the shamans say, all time is all now. There is no past, future, or present. It's all awareness and now, which is so, so important for us to think about. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. Yeah, you both were so awesome today. Uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. Give us a thumbs up, share with your friends and family. Please su subscribe to the ch channel. Uh, also go uh, join our new uh, private platform, alphabetic.com forward slash join dash us. Joel, I invite you to come on. We'd be happy to give you a full executive free membership. Come on, we could create a group there. Uh, actually, this could be a great platform for you because you don't really have a website, right? Or anything. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like Eileen McCusick's in there. Don Lester, shout out to Don. She's in the chat. She's in the Friday Club, Friday group. Um, she's been in chat today. She's in there, is active. Cool. All sorts of powerful, powerful people, presenters, thought leaders, et cetera, are in there. We could create a group around the Toltec uh, technologies or whatever we want to call it, dreaming. Uh, that would be really cool, actually. That would probably be one of the most power, most popular groups, actually. Uh, so, yeah, I'll let me know. If you want to do that. I'd love that. Yeah, okay. that'd be really cool. Um, okay, guys. Well, remember to get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go plant something, uh, go show Mother Nature some love. I'm going to go out and hug this redwood right out here. How fortunate I am. I literally have a redwood that grows across the street from me. Uh, and now and you know you're hugging uh, a distant <laughs> ancestral relative there. Right? Um, so, uh, you know, one thing, too, there's so much interplay. We've done shows on um, uh, on the the Russian mystic uh, the ringing cedars books, right. With Anastasia, Anastasia, and there's so much interplay between Anastasia and this it's, I, we brought it up on that, on that show. And it's just goes to show that all cultures have this grand tradition of these masters that bring us and, and they have the same issue, people calling it out that it's fake, that she's not real, et cetera. And in the end, it doesn't matter because the gnosis is there, or excuse me, the logos is there. When you read it, you know it's emitting these eternal truths. And thanks for bringing that back into our consciousness. I'm going to order the books and start reading them again. It's been since like the late 90s that I read, started reading them. So I, I never read them deeply as you guys, and I'm really inspired now to read them. So we will add those, you guys, on um, listening, alphabetic.com forward slash book list. You can go there and you can grab them there, and that gives us a little commission as well. So, awesome. okay, guys. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a beautiful weekend. And how fitting. I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> how fitting that we're talking about the, uh, the Mexican shamanic arts as I'm off to that place. So I will hold this in my heart as I'm there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys there. There, Follow Anarchapoco. And uh, yeah, tickets will be dropping soon for Music in Sky. So uh, keep an eye out for that, musicinsky.com. Love you guys. And oh, we're taking next week off because I am in Mexico. So there will be no alpha cast next week, uh, but we'll catch you on the flip side when I get back. Love you guys. Take care.